Can you believe it's the last day of the Woman in Product Conference? I'm Ronnie Mavram, Product Manager at Google and member of the Hashtag 21 WIP Content Selection Committee. Welcome back to the Blaze Your Trail stage. And before we get started, huge thank you to all of our sponsors, speakers, amazing audience, and everyone who's making this conference the dynamic space that it is. During this session, identifying potential and welcoming change, we have three fantastic speakers. First on stage, we have Brielle Nikoloff. As a linguist and a conversation designer with no technical background, Brielle's mission is to empower fellow non-technical creatives to build amazing things. Her work as co-founder and head of product at Botmock is labor of love. Let's hear her experience and expertise during her presentation from laid off to head of product. Please join me in welcoming Brielle to our stage. Hi, my name is Brielle Nikoloff and I am head of product at Botmuck. Thank you for being with me here today. I cannot even tell you how excited I am to be speaking at this summit. And while this isn't live, future Brielle is in the chat. So future Brielle, go ahead and pop a hello in the chat. Cool. And I have a question for everyone. Have you ever felt like you are going to get fired? And the reason I ask this is because a couple years ago, my best friend and I, who is also a woman, we were talking about how for some reason we always feel like we're underperforming or about to get fired and we don't know why. And our boyfriends were with us at the time and they were like, <laughs> literally like can't relate at all. Never feel like that. So I was like, why is this? And the more I've chatted with other women, the more it seems like this is a theme. Today, I really want to talk about things that have helped me push past that feeling and kind of set my, my brain up for preparing for the next thing should anything ever happen. And for some reason, it helps in my day to day. And then I also am more prepared for the next thing that might come. So let's talk about how to develop your product skills and gain responsibility, even when you're not in an official product role, how to find product roles you can get hired into at small companies that provide a really good opportunity for growth, and how to always be networking with possible new employees or colleagues. I really want to acknowledge first that I am privileged in many ways, a couple of which include being a white cisgendered woman, and my career has only been in tech, so please listen to my stories with these lenses and be aware. A lot of my advice not, may not transfer over to other job markets like government, healthcare, etc. And granted, in my last job, which I loved, I did have a good reason to feel like I might get fired at any moment. And that was because I was at a very small startup with not much funding. And one day, funding literally just ran out. So we couldn't pay my salary anymore. And I had to face some hard truths at that point. One, companies will never look out for you. You have to be the one looking out for you. And it's not personal, it's just business. It's just how it works. Two, someday you might want to leave your current role or someday you might have to leave your role because of a bad manager or you moving or whatever, lots of reasons. So I am going to go into some techniques I used in my first role that I think helped me helped set me up for success to get my second job. And then when I was hired into that second job, how I gradually moved into a position of leadership over the course of nine or 10 months. All right, without further ado, let's get into some of the practical stuff. So just from a little, for a little context, I went from college graduate to voice UX designer. That was my first job ever. And when I was laid off from that job, I got hired as a PM and moved to head of product about nine months in. First, always be looking for ways to gain responsibility or recognition and looking for ways to demonstrate that to people around you. So don't be obnoxious about it, but remember that your manager needs to be managed by you. Express in your one-on-ones that you have personal professional goals that you are trying to get towards and your manager should be helping you get there. So as soon as you share this information with you, you kind of make them... Uh, a helper in terms of, you know, getting more responsibility, or maybe they can help get you into certain meetings 
where maybe it's a product discussion or what have you if you are interested in more, moving into more of a product role. And my past boss didn't give me any product duties at all. So, I mean, why would he? I was hired as a designer. And when we would have small conversations about product, I realized I really liked thinking about it. And then I would bring up these conversations and start chatting more with him about it. And then eventually he started to kind of trust that I had good ideas. And then he would ping me and say, hey, what do you think about this? I want to get your opinion on this decision we're making. So be vocal about it and demonstrate that you do have really good things to contribute. Don't be shy about this. The other thing that I don't want you to be shy about is pushing back and disagreeing because my current boss has cited many times that the reason he saw me as a possible good fit to move from a PM to head of product while I've been here is that I do challenge him when he's saying things and I'm really invested in this product so I don't want to settle for decisions that don't seem right and I never do. Um, I do have to compromise sometimes but there's always a discussion about it. So never, uh, don't feel like you're making anyone happier just by agreeing with them because really they want to know what you actually think. All right. The other thing is that make sure you are doing, doing stuff in your day-to-day -day that will impress leadership in your company or your next set of interviewers and try if at all possible to make sure it's measurable because no one can argue with data. And if you tell me that you were the PM uh, at a company and you oversaw the whole new onboarding process, in, like you implemented an entirely new onboarding process into the product, I would say to you, okay, but why and what happened? Because user retention could have plummeted after you did that. So try to be thinking about your day-to-day -day and what you're doing in terms of what is actually um, measurably happening and why it's happening and basically ladder it up to the broader business schools. Um, that is how PMs work on teams. And so if you can demonstrate that you're thinking like this already, that is huge. Okay. And I will kind of end this one with... If you start being the one on your team that's calling things out when they're stagnating or when everyone is kind of confused but nobody's really speaking up about it, if you're able to identify those feelings early on and step up and be the one to kind of propose a path forward, that is huge because that shows everyone around you that you're not afraid to be the one to say, I think everyone is confused and... I, I don't really know what we're confused about. Like, that's what's so weird about it is that sometimes you don't even know why things are feeling slow or awkward. And you kind of just have to be the one to say it. And then as soon as everyone's in that call together, really magical things start happening because people will start to share their perspective on stuff and things get done then as, as long as you can drive them forward. So be the one that will bring up those awkward situations. Always be networking is number two. A small disclaimer about networking. I used to hate networking so much. I'm an introvert. I would get so, uh, so much anxiety before every time I had an informational interview with someone. And the reason I was doing so many informational interviews is because I had planned to go to medical school my whole life. And literally on graduation day, I was like, I don't want to do this. <laughs> I don't know why I've been doing this this long. And I what do I do now? So I knew that I loved linguistics and I wanted to do something with that. And that's really how I found voice design. But the book Designing Your Life, highly recommend it. They basically tell you, go schedule 100 informational interviews and learn from those people. Don't go into it expecting a job. Just ask them things like, what would you look for if you were to hire me as a PM? And that way, just kind of going back to point number one, you can always be sure that your day-to-day -day is relating directly to what those people are going to be wanting to see on your resume or hear in your interviews. And you can always be kind of gradually preparing for that. So I do a lot of networking now, specifically on Twitter and LinkedIn. Those are the two hotspots for tech people. And the reason I still do it is because I have direct proof that it has worked for me. It's how I got my second role after I got laid off. 
I had met my current boss at a conference. And when I was laid off, I emailed him among like a hundred other people granted. And he happened to be hiring. So it, I have never gotten a job through a, a portal. And I firmly believe, especially if you want a role on a small team that has a lot of opportunities for growth internally, then you need to be connecting with people and not looking for job postings on LinkedIn because these small companies don't have the budget for posting those those job openings on LinkedIn. Only you know big companies like Google and Spotify, et cetera, have that budget. So kind of always be reaching out to people, build those connections. And then when you start looking, you can ping them and say, hey, I'm like, looking to move out of my current role and do you have any do you know of anything right now this actually happened to me a few months ago a person I've known for like two years she messaged me and she basically told me exactly that and I sent her some ideas that she applied to and interviewed for um I don't know specifically if she took them but it they were some good leads for her and people when you build these relationships over time they want to be on your side when you uh are looking for a new job most of the time. I mean, there's always exceptions, but just find the good people. And for every bad person, you'll probably find good, two good people. You just have to put yourself out there and actually message people and not seem like you're trying to get a job from them because you're not. Okay. Number three, always be looking for new roles and always be documenting. So I started looking at every single company, every product through new lens when I was laid off because I started thinking to myself, you know, every possible company out there is a new place that I could end up. So now, for example, I, uh, my team hosted a virtual summit this past winter and we used a platform called gather.town. If anyone's heard of it, let me know in the chat because it is such a sick platform. And I, I started stalking their team because I was like, oh, wow, I wonder how big their team is. Turns out they're a small startup, about 10 people, I think. And lo and behold, they had an open product position on their website. So I immediately stashed this in a tool called Teal HQ. It is a Chrome extension and it is it takes two seconds to literally take the link of that company or the job posting and throw it into Teal. Uh, and then as soon as you're now ready to go look for new jobs, you have this whole pipeline of interesting products, interesting companies that directly, directly relate to your interests, hopefully. Uh, And the reason GatherTown was interesting to me is because while I love linguistics so, so much, (laughs) such a nerd, and I love product, another thing I'm really passionate about is the future of work and empowering people to work when and where they need to. And I was, trust me, I promise you I was on this train before COVID, but uh, Gather Town is a perfect product example of something that can empower people to work from wherever they are. So it's kind of just another intersection of something that I love to think about and a product role at a company like that in the future might be interesting. So I stash it. Um, cool, cool, cool. Okay, the other thing to document is wins or sticky situations. So this happens all the time. You make mistakes, your colleagues make mistakes, people get stuff stagnates, kind of like what I was talking about earlier. And when you are trying to impress that next person about what you've just been doing for the last (laughs) one, two, three, four years, it is so important to have a bunch of examples in your back pocket about what kind of leader you are. And it's really hard to remember this stuff because it is just the day to day. So now when I make a mistake or when I feel proud about something I've done, I write two or three bullet points just in a document. It's literally called career. It's not very structured. I just put it in there and I know it's there. And it's enough for me to remember kind of what happened, but now I kind of have just a bunch of stuff that I can be using for these interview questions that are like, tell me about a time when you, you had to step up as a leader on your team. You know, it, it's so hard to think of that stuff in the moment, but if you have 
a bunch of stuff you've collect you've collected over time, then it makes it that much easier. All right, and last point that I wanted to mention: a lot of my uh, a lot of mentees ask me, "I'm not a PM. I'm not in a product role. How can I, you know, keep? Uh, how can I exercise my product muscles?" And my suggestion is always look at what's going on around you, on your team, and think about what you would do. So say, like, what data would you pull if you were about to launch that new release so that you can track its effectiveness? And what, uh, what changes would you have made to that feature and why? And how does that relate to the higher up business goal? So you don't have to be doing it per se, but if you're thinking deeply about it as you go and documenting it, then you have so much to lean on. And for me, when I'm hiring a PM, especially in a startup environment, I want to know that A, you're a lot, you're able to context switch, and B, you're really invested in product. And you're not just in this because it's like the new cool job for millennials to have. And C, because, um, because thinking about product really excites you and it's something you like to do. I just want to know that you are a thinker and you'll think deeply about this and you're a doer and you can drive real action. So anything you can do in your day-to-day that would illustrate either of those, ideally both, is something that your your future employer wants to see. I think we're out of time. Thank you again for being here with me and happy to answer more questions in the chat. And I'm excited to see you in other sessions at Summit. Thank you, Brielle. I love your advice. And this conference where we are right now is a great opportunity to network and learn about new organizations. Next up, I'm honored to welcome Sarika Thiagi. Sarika is a serial entrepreneur and a professional with 17 years of experience. She is a self-starter and passionate about solving real life problems. She currently works at Amazon as a senior product manager and runs her side gig, Scarlet Fresh Shoe. Join me in welcoming Sarika to our stage for her presentation, Advance Your Career Through Goal-Driven Side Gig. Hi everyone. Today I would like you to first walk through this scenario. Have you ever experienced that your skills didn't match the job description of your dream product role, maybe? So you went ahead and took a bunch of courses, you read a a lot of books or um, read blogs to learn all that you could about that skill. How about despite all of this, you couldn't build that credibility with your prospective employer to land the job or even land an interview. You wonder why? Maybe because you could talk a lot about that skill, but maybe didn't have much to demonstrate that in action. So how do you get your dream job when your day job does not allow you to build those skills needed? I'm Sarika Tyagi, a senior product manager at Amazon, and I would love to share my journey on how my side gig helped me advance in my career and helped me transition from a B2B product operations role to a B2C product management role in one of the most sought after product companies. Before Scarlet, I had applied to hundreds of jobs. I had read a lot of product books and I had subscribed to blogs. But none of this effort translated into getting my dream job. I wondered, I have the education, I have some relevant experience, I have the drive. But I quickly realized I lacked the product experience to demonstrate in action. So after mulling for over four years, I finally launched Scarlet Fresh Shoe, my side gig in 2015. 
It's an e-commerce company that offers instant shoe repair and foot pain relief solutions for on-the-go women. Now, I came from the operations world. So, uh, well, you know, learning the product or uh, launching the product end-to-end in bootstrap resources or launching the product directly to the users was came with a very steep curve. But I had launched four product lines, to over 20 products, and I took the revenue to six-figure annually. So along my journey, as I steered through, you know, all the hardships of really launching this uh, side gig, I realized that I got this, you know, the hands-on experience, but more importantly, the confidence that I needed to, to be called a product professional. Enough to quit my full day, full-time job and start my second entrepreneurial venture called My22 BMI in healthcare space. And eventually that led into my corporate jobs at Capital One and Amazon, all while doing Scarlet as my side gig. So now that I've shared a bit about my journey, for those who are wondering, so where do I begin? For you, I propose a three-step framework that will help you evolve your mindset from, I think a side gig may be a good idea, to, I know the side gig I want to work on. Now, this framework, it, it involves a lot of my you know, personal failures and uh, successes of having started my entrepreneurial venture, my side gig. But it also in, 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 it has integrated a lot of conversations with my fellow entrepreneurs, um, aspiring entrepreneurs and side hustlers in my network. So how, what's this framework about? Step one, identify how do you learn best? You know, some people learn by reading, some people learn by taking courses, others learn by doing it hands-on. Now, studies have suggested that in order to truly internalize a concept, you must repeat it several times. Granted, while people learn differently, hands-on learning by side gig allows you the opportunity to learn and iterate and truly internalize that skill or concept you're looking for. Second step, what's your motivation to do a side gig? Are you looking to supplement income? Are you looking to enhance your skill to advance your career? Or are you looking to fulfill your perennial dream of entrepreneurial venture? Now, motivations can be different, but it is important to understand what your primary motive is because you'll find yourself being influenced in the type of gig you choose and how you decide to execute it once you start it. So find what your motivation is. If you're still thinking, yay, I want to learn by hands-on learning and I want to do a side gig because I want to learn a new skill, then the step three will help you narrow down the type of gig you could work on. I call this as a side gig suggester model. Now this model broken down into four phases, as you can see, first, identify your career goals. For me, it was going from a B2B space to a B2C space. Based on your goals, identify what are the key skills you require to you build that are your key gaps. For me, like typically if you see in a B2B to a B2C space, how you launch your product or bring that product to the market could vary like significantly. So launch was a really big skill that I wanted to, in a B2C space, I wanted to build on or demonstrate. Third, take those skills or that skill and fit into the product strategy phase. Is it discovery or design? Is it building the product or is it launching the product or a combination of these? 
For, for me, clearly it was launching a product. Step four is now associate that with your side gig type. So, you know, if launching is your key skill, you don't need to really go through the whole discovery design process or uh, building a new product from scratch. You could take an existing product in the market. You could package it to make it specific to your target customer space and become a seller or a reseller on an e-commerce platform such as Amazon or Etsy or, you know, eBay and so forth. So now that we've talked about, um, you know, the, the model um, of how you could identify your side gig, I do want to acknowledge that thinking about a gig and actually executing it, they're they are two big things, different things. Uh, there's a lot of inertia that could come your way. And, um, you know, along my journey, I learned a lot of lessons, but there were these three lessons that really stood out for me that helped me in those very difficult times to continue to move forward in managing my life, my job, and my side gig. Lesson one was follow your passion. You know, before landing on Scarlet, I researched two other initiatives to the point where I had robust business cases for them. But I could never find myself motivated enough or excited enough to work on them. And then I realized that, you know, while the market was big enough, like target market seemed big enough, but then I realized that, you know, I never deeply connected with either the problem space or the solutions that I had in mind. You know, always, whatever side gig you choose does not matter. Make sure you feel connected and passionate about that topic. Second, start small, but do now. When I started Scarlet, I didn't know if and when it would start making money for me or what would be the second product I would launch or for that matter, if and where it would land, would I make it? What I knew is that one customer problem that I felt passionate about, I connected with, and I wanted to solve it. You know, um, I remember before I officially launched Scarlet for months, um, you know, every weekend I would go to the DSW stores and look at every shoe one at a time and measure the heel tips to really internalize and um, understand that landscape better. Remember this, if you start today, six months down the lane, when you look back, you would have walked that extra steps that if you did not start today, you wouldn't be that far ahead. Third, be bold with outsourcing. You know, work-life balance is a very important aspect of a healthy, stressless life. To me, it is all about prioritization, producing leverage, and making choices. When I started Scarlet, I wanted to do it all myself because you know I wanted to manage the operations and give that best customer experience because I didn't, I guess, trust delegating that task. But very soon I realized that if I don't do that, I won't be able to expand. And which led me to finding my third party um, fulfillment services um, in Scarlet. So, you know, for all those thinking here, um, is side gig the only way to advance your career? I don't think so. Is this one of the ways that has, that gives you the hands-on experience that has helped me and several other hustlers that I have spoken with and connected with in my journey? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. So if you're one of those people who are thinking and sitting here and thinking side gig is a way to go for me as well, I would like to leave you with this one thought. As daunting as it may sound, remember a journey of a thousand miles begins with that first single step. Go conquer the world. Do it now. 
Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you later in the day. Thank you. Thank you, Sarika. You are the definition of hustle, and I absolutely love it. Next up, please join me in welcoming May Liu. May leads identity strategy and products at Fast, a Series B startup. Prior to Fast, May held five different product roles at Coinbase, including sales, marketing, support, business onboarding, consumer foundations, and trust and safety. Prior to product, she spent five years in consulting, building financial data and customer experience tools, and managing teams while re working remotely as a digital nomad. Join me in welcoming May to our stage for her presentation, identifying where, when, and how to pivot. Hi there, thanks for joining my presentation today on identifying when, where, and how to pivot. My name is May Liu, and I'm currently a product manager at Fast, focusing on identity strategy as well as product experiences. So to start, I wanted to give you a brief intro about my product journey. So when I first came out of school, I had no idea what I wanted to do, and I got super lucky that I fell into an opportunity at a really small boutique consulting firm implementing finance tools. Uh, or internal tools for finance audiences. From that experience, I learned that I really loved technology. I loved working with engineers. and um, But I did also notice that there were some things that were missing for me. So it wasn't super hot on finance. And ultimately, I really wanted to be closer to the end user. So when the company got acquired by a much larger consulting firm, um, I had a lot more opportunity to go into different product areas and tried out data as well as ended up in, you know, building up internal tools for sales, marketing, and support audiences. So one day, you know, a few years into this, I realized, you know, my job, I really like what I'm doing day to day, but the environment isn't really what I really want to be in. Um, I had stopped traveling at the time and I really wanted to be traveling more. And so I thought to myself, how could I take the one thing I don't like about my current role and flip it and make it, turn it into my greatest asset? So I found a program called Remote Year that basically allows you to keep the job that you have, but travel around the world with a group of 70 other people. I pitched it to our senior leadership team and got it approved. And ultimately, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So if you have the opportunity post-pandemic in your role to be remote and travel, I highly recommend looking in. Uh, to these type of programs. At the same time in 2017, it was first time people manager. So the whole experience of like growing and developing people was very new to me, but I really enjoyed it. Um, so from there, um, as I returned back to the States, I decided I wanted to be in one place and uh, took an offer at Queenbase to join in-house, uh, focusing on my bread and butter, which was enterprise products. Because the company was in a high growth stage, I got really fortunate and had the opportunity to work on our business products, so specifically onboarding and billing. And through that experience, I learned that I really loved building things for end users and solving ambiguous problems and decided that I wanted to do that 100% um, of the time. So in the middle of the pandemic, I applied to join our product org officially and uh, definitely took a little bit longer. I would say if you're you know, making a transition during the pandemic, uh, my one piece of advice would be to pa be patient. And um, ultimately landed in our consumer team focused on foundations, which turned into a platform products uh, like team role focused on trust and safety. After being in that role for about six months, I realized that I really liked what I was doing and felt like I had finally like found my niche, uh, but started to miss that like small company feeling that I had early in my career. So from there, I looked at some startups in the market and ultimately found one that was in e-commerce and identity, which was another area that I was very passionate about. And that's how I ended up at Fast. So if anything, I hope that my experience really goes to show that you don't need to know exactly what you want to do. It's okay to like try different things and find out what you like and what you don't like. And hopefully this presentation gives you some tangible tools uh, to help make your pivoting experience much faster. 
So with that, um, the first topic, which is when to pivot. I think this is a really um, interesting question because I don't think there's a formula for when to pivot. Um, I know a lot of people like to say that if you've only been in a role for about a year, um, don't leave because it's going to look bad. I actually don't believe that's true. I think that as long as you have a really strong why, it's okay to take any change that you need to take. So some of the more common reasons I hear around why do I want to pivot, um, I think it comes from the way you feel. So a lot of people will say like, it just feels like every, it's like hard to open up my laptop. Things feel really hard. Or other people will say, you know, they feel too easy. Like I can do it in my sleep. And I think one thing to tease out is when we say that things are too hard, like what type of hard are you talking about? Because I think there is a world in which um, there's like a good hard, meaning that it's stretching you, it's pushing you, it's growing you. And those are the types of opportunities that instead of like retreating, I think we should step into and ultimately ask for support and um, allow them to push us and grow us. The second piece is um, for me, one thing that was very helpful in understanding what was missing I have this like personal mantra that I was uh, told a long time ago that really stuck with me, which is that your 20s are for learning, your 30s are for earning, and your 40s are for returning. The time periods are totally arbitrary. However, the framework is really helpful in understanding how to prioritize what you're looking for at that point in your life. So I think the what's missing question, I think a lot of the times I was able to answer by having a really clear prioritization and what I was looking for at that point in my life. So the second question is really, why now? Um, and I think the thing to remember is it's definitely a two-sided equation where you need to be ready for change mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, and the company also needs to have an opportunity to stretch and meet your needs. So if your current employer isn't able to do that, that's when you really need to go and look out in the market. Next, I think a really common question is where to pivot. So if you know that you love product management, um, but maybe your gut is telling you like the type of product that you're building isn't really something that you enjoy. I think that um, a really key thing to remember is that a lot of different, uh, there's only really two dimensions in which to pivot within products. So one is up the ladder. And that really focuses on your people skills as you move up and become a manager or an executive. And then the second dimension is going across different specializations. And I think there's only three dimensions in which, you know, things really change as you move across specializations. And that's who are you building things for? What tools are you using to build them? And how much ambiguity are you really dealing with? And uh, for me, when I started in enterprise apps, I definitely took path A, where I only flexed one of those uh, changes at a time and eventually got to where I wanted to be by only, you know, having to pick up one piece and like spinning one piece at a time. Uh, it's definitely possible to start from somewhere and jump completely across to somewhere completely new. I think you just need to think about how you get there and really leveraging um, key supporters in order to do so. And then similarly, like uh, if you're like already a manager, you can definitely pivot to somewhere completely different, but you may need to adjust your expectations. And it's pretty common to see people get down levels, but ultimately in the long run, because you have that management experience or the people experience, I've seen people rise up uh, the ladder more quickly. So with that, the other where to pivot that I hear a lot about is company size. So I think that um, when you're at a hyper growth company or a scaled company, it definitely, you start to feel this uh, inside building transition. So I definitely felt like at one point I was spending 50% of my time like aligning people versus focusing on the outside product and um, at that time, my priorities were to learn and to build things. And so I wanted to move to an earlier stage company. I think that um, similarly, uh, you have to think about 
uh, what's your own internal pace. So some people really like wartime and some people really want like a peaceful environment. And so this type of framework is really helpful for thinking through where you might fit in better. Um, and then lastly, I wanna point out that a common misconception is to go to an earlier stage company that you need to be like a startup person. I think um, one thing I've learned now being at Fast is we, we definitely prioritize people that have been at scaled companies, hyper growth companies over like founder types because we want people who have seen scale and can kind of push uh, the product to reach those limits. And so I think that's a really common misconception um, and it's much easier to go backwards um, on from the right side of this equation to the left side. So with that, how to pivot. Um, so my little shortcut for remembering this is the four S's. I think the first step is choosing your speed because I think every person is different. For me, I really liked lily padding, but other people are leapers. And I think the key thing to remember there is that just changes your strategy and how you approach um, bridging that gap. So if you're a lily patter, generally, it's generally just like a skills gap and you can pick out whatever skill you're deficient in and learn to fill that gap. So say it's, you know, you're used to building internal products and you wanna to shift to external products, then the only real difference is that you're, you might be building on a different stack of technology or you might be um, building for a different type of customer. And from there, I would say like the best way to fill that gap is just hands-on experience. Um, a lot of companies that are in that like scaled or hyper growth phase, they'll offer like 20% projects that allow you to be really hands-on and learn the experience that you need um, doing a mini project. From there, um, I want to highlight that a lot of times we think we have skills gaps and what we really have are confidence gaps. So a good example of that is um, when I was transitioning from consulting to product, I thought like, I know that it's really similar, but, but maybe I'm not good enough. And so I enrolled in product scroll thinking that it would help me help teach me the missing skills. And I think what it really opened my eyes to was the fact that I had the right instincts already and that I could do the job that I really wanted. And it just gave me the extra boost of confidence. And another way you could get that if you didn't want to like enroll in like a training program is just to make a uh, network with other PMs and make friends and just talk to them about like what their experiences are and like what you've done and ultimately gain that confidence through um, like a close friend or relationship. Third, I think another blocker that tends to happen is rustiness. So when you've been at a company for like two or three years and you haven't really interviewed, it can be very easy to feel nervous or scared to take a leap. Um, I had that experience and the way I broke through it is I actually signed up to be an interviewer. That really helped put me in the right mindset to think through how do I want to tell my story and like what different criteria could they be thinking of um, as they're evaluating me? And that gave me a lot of comfort in, in practicing what I needed to to take the next leap. Lastly, I would say if you're taking a really big leap and there are a lot of skills to bridge, I think the best way to do that is ultimately through a passion project because that shows entrepreneurial spirit. It shows that you're really invested and making the transition and that you can flex your like PM muscles in whatever area that you're looking to transition into. Another common way that I've seen this big gap get bridged is to transition into operations with like that tangential product. And a good example of that is actually customer support. Surprisingly enough, I know a ton of people who have gone from customer support, really embodying the pain points of like the customer into product management in that area. And then lastly, a lot of people um, opt to go for business school. I think that that's definitely a great way to gain relationships that you may need in order to like bridge the gap. And lastly, I would say um, finding the right support is super critical. So not only does that mean uh, working, that really means like working for people that you know align with your values. So an example I'll give there is uh, part of the reason I was able to get the digital nomading piece approved with my leadership is I knew 
the second I accepted the job that I was working for someone who was super innovative. And I think that that's really critical is like on the way into an opportunity, how are you evaluating the environment that you're putting yourself into? So with that, um, the other piece of advice I would give is friends and family, lean on them, leverage them. So when I transitioned from um, like con uh, into consumer product, I had interviews and for some reason, even though I had a ton of PM friends, I thought that it was cheating to ask them for advice uh, on the interview. And so I just tried to do it by myself and that was a huge mistake. You should definitely lean on people that are your friends. It's not cheating, it's called resourcefulness and you should definitely tap into your network. Lastly, I would encourage you to nail your story because ultimately that's what's gonna sell you to uh, the opportunity that you're trying to get and focus it as a business case. So you wanna take your experiences spin them, make sure that people understand how exactly that transfer is into the role that you want and highlight and be very honest about your gaps and tell people about all the different things that you did to proactively fill those gaps. One last thing I want to leave you with is that um, people want to say yes to you. I think we forget that. We get very, um, it's very easy to feel vulnerable and insecure. And I think that Instead, you should focus more on giving people a reason to say yes. Um, they definitely want to. So with that, thank you so much for listening to this presentation. I hope that you found something that resonates with you and inspires you to take that big pivot in your life. And definitely join me at my interactive session and check the agenda for more details. Thank you, May, and I couldn't agree more on the importance of having a clear North Star and using that to ground our product strategies and teams. Huge thank you to Brielle and Sarika as well, who have joined us today, and all of you, our listeners. I've really enjoyed doing this so far, so I highly encourage you to connect with our speakers in our follow-up interactive sessions later today. Additionally, to Brielle's point, Check out all the ways that you can network with your fellow attendees. Reach out directly by clicking on any attendee name in the chat or meet someone new in the networking mixer where you'll be paired with a fellow PM for a timed chat. Click into the mixer on the left. I'll be at the Google booth if you wanna make a new friend there as well. Thank you again for joining us today.